It's fine. Okay, Be'ezat Hashem, Na'aseh V'Natzliach. I'd like to welcome you to the Lighthouse Project as we begin our lesson tonight on the ethics of our fathers, Pirkei Avot. The title of tonight's class is Me, Myself, and Another Jew. Be'ezat Hashem, tonight we're going to get spiritually pumped. That we're going to really, Be'emet, going to... Uh, get connected to the time that we're in and to the and, and and the spiritual work that's at hand. And before we get started, I'd like to give an honorable mention to our class sponsor. We have H uh, and M Builders, and uh, doing this uh, the Dornbush family doing this in honor of their grandfather. Bezat Hashem that H and M Builders and the Dornbush family have Bachavat Sachai and all they do. Is this not working? It's working. Okay. Bachavat Sachai and all they do. Be'ezat Hashem that they have continued success and that we should uh, also uh, merit to, uh, to, they should merit to health, wealth, and happiness. Amen. Okay, I'd also like to uh, dedicate tonight's learning to the Ilui Nishmat of Reonen Ben Fani. And this, besides the Ilu Nishmat of Ronen Ben Fani, it should also be to the Refua Shelema of Yaniv Ben Rina and David Ben Zohara. Okay, let's get started. Okay, as we find ourselves in a spiritual envelope between Pesach and Shavuot, a 49-day journey of spiritual and character refinement, a journey that's actually a custom-made journey for the Jews in the desert, a journey that helped that group of people peel away the slave mentality and adapt them to a renewed version of themselves. It was the beginning of the physical freedom and the leading up to their spiritual freedom. This is an experience that's thousands of years old, yet we are privy to it today. We here today can go through the exact same journey as the Jews in the desert. A 49-day journey of character and spiritual refinement. Even though that we're in this super modern and technological generation, we also have a chance to peel away our mental and physical slavery. And we also have a chance to get freed from our life burdens, just like the Jews in the desert. We actually get to merit to a new outlook, a rejuvenated outlook, a new vantage point on life and our role in the Jewish nation. And even more so, our acting role within it. Today is the 25th day of the Omer. No, that was yesterday. Today is the 26th day of the Omer. In other words, that's why I wanted to count before. The 25th day of the Omer marks the halfway mark. Half of the journey is behind us. 26 days, 25, day, 25 days plus one is behind us. Now, if we're halfway there, if you're plugged in, and you're connected to this envelope of time that I'm speaking of, you get a sense that we're getting reprogrammed during these days. You get a sense that there's a hidden agenda between Hazal, the Torah, and even God. Something is going on. There's a message that they're trying, that they're trying to, that we're trying to receive, or that they're trying to give. And that message, if you pay attention, is promoting the solid message of brotherly love. The message of tolerance, inclusion, empathy, sympathy, Compassion, acceptance, love, and of course, the secret of the Jew, unity. 
And every layer of our day-to-day -day life has been pointing to this direction for the past three weeks. If you pay close attention to what we've been up to in our spiritual lives in the past three weeks, you'll notice there's the, that there's the same interlaced message just found in different places. And the messages are Derech Eretz Kadmala Torah which will explain it in depth within the lesson. The huge lesson of the huge foundation of Judaism and of course love and unity. And all these lessons are derived from several different places. We have Pirkei Avot, the ethics of our fathers, which is a compilation of Mishnayot, dealing mostly with ethical and moral principles. There's no halachot in Pirkei Avot. It's strictly Musar, which is the proper moral conduct, uh, conduct, con conduct for a Jew which is then complemented by the counting of the Omer. What is the Omer? It's the character refinement through the Sefirot. What are the Sefirot? Well, it's a very high level Kabbalistic concept, but to simplify it, it's the 10 attributes that Hashem runs the world. Hashem runs the world with these 10, character, uh, ten characters that emulate Him. For example, there's three on top and seven on the bottom. During the Omer period, we deal with the lower seven, which are Chokhmah, Bina, Ches, I'm sorry, that's the upper ones. Chesed, Gvura, Tiferet, Hod, Netzach, Yesod, and Malchut. And each one corresponds towards a different type of character traits. For example, Chesed is for kindness, for love. Gevura is for strength, for fear. Tiferet is for beauty and for mercy. And every single week we visit a different character trait, a different attribute of a Kadosh Baruch Hu, which in turn, by paying attention to it, focusing in on it, on the lesson of each single day, we're able to refine our character. We're able to refine our spiritual character as well. And it's supposed to bring us to a certain point. So the Pirkei Avot has one role. Sfirat HaOmer passed the elementary uh, uh, exercise of just counting from 1 to 49 has a higher level of understanding, a higher level of, of work of refining you and your midot. And the rep repetitive lesson of the story of Rabbi Akiva and his 24,000 students. How many times have you heard that story in the past three weeks? The rabbis can't stop talking about it. And typically, this is the time of year that they talk about it. Very rarely will you hear about it in Rosh Hashanah. Very rarely will you hear the story of Rabbi Akiva and the 24,000 students in Sukkot, or Pesach, or any other time. Why is it mentioned now? Because the moral of the story is that we had 24,000 Torah giants that did not respect one another. They were lacking some moral value. To the point that it wasn't tolerated that Hashem got rid of them in a plague. And the students that came after these 24,000 students, like, like, like the author of the Zohar, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, or some of the other rabbis that came along with it, were the lowest level rabbis. They say that those 24,000 rabbis were on a much higher level. Could you imagine how much Torah we lost? Why? And if you pay even closer attention, almost every portion of the weekly Torah reading is heavily, heavily, heavily laden with what? Mitzvot of Ben Adam Lechaviro. Mitzvot that are dealing with civil laws. Why? Because we are a, a, a newborn nation that we need to develop into a civil society. I mean, we were just slaves a few days ago, right? And now we're in the middle of the desert. What do we know? We were just slaves. What do we need? What we need is we need to know how to interact with one another. 
We need to know how to live with each other. We, know, we need to know what's right and what's wrong. We need to know how to get along. And all these mitzvot that are in the parashiot are 99% ben adam lechaviro. And all this is happening during the amazing month of Iyar. The month of Iyar, the month of health. Iyar stands for Ani Hashem Rufecha. The month that we have an abundance of physical health, spiritual health, mental health. It's available. You just have to draw it into your life. In other words, if we're, you're really working on yourself and you want to better yourself, it's not a problem. This is the month for it. You have a sa'ata deshmaya if you want to heal yourself. All this leading to one destination point. Everything that I just mentioned is just an exercise to get us to the finish line, which is Shavuot. In just a few weeks from now, we're going to stand in shul, similarly to the Jews standing on the bottom of, of, of uh, Har Sinai, to receive the Torah again. Just like every year. Every year we, we, get to, we get to shul and what do we say to Hashem? Hashem, I'm ready to receive the Torah again. On a higher level, on a deeper level. Shavuot. We're in the desert that exact same time. The holiday of Shavuot is the time when all the Jews healed from, all, from any ailment. The blind can see. The deaf can hear. Broken bones healed. Everybody got back their health. Even death left us. And we were able to achieve unity like no other time in history. Except in parentheses, Purim. That's where they also achieved it. But just for this particular lesson, they were Amichad Belevichad. One nation, one heart. All standing in the foot of Har Sinai. With so much going on right now, now you all of a sudden it, you put it into focus. Like, wow, we're really, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of layers to this 49 day journey. And if you're really applying yourself and if you're really connected and you are studying Pirkei Avot and you are counting the Omer on a higher level and you are trying to learn your lesson out from Bi Akiva student and you are understanding that it has actually, you know, we started at one point and it ends somewhere and, there, and that you're in a month of healing, you can say, you know what, I'm in. I'm in the game. But with all this going on tonight, I'd like to focus in on one layer of the spiritual envelope. The layer of character and spiritual refinement. The layer that's so beautifully compiled for us by our sages. The layer of Pirkei Avot, the ethics of our fathers. It's a, it's a set of Mishnayot, a collection of Mishnayot from Masechet Avot, which Hazal have compiled to give us a moral compass, a moral GPS for the ages. How to think, how to behave, how to care for yourself, your neshama, and a fellow Jew. And furthermore, how to put it into action, how to interact with another Jew. How a Jew treats another Jew. And why is this so important? Why is it so important for us to know how to think like a Jew, how to act like a Jew, how to talk like a Jew, what to want as a Jew, and furthermore, that not, nothing is more lofty than to know how to interact with another Jew. That's the top of the learning. Is the, the, the interaction of the do, the, of, of, the interaction with another Jew, not the, necessarily the, the refinement. The refinement is so you can get yourself to know how to interact with another Jew. Why is that so important? Because the journey started 
with us being freed from physical slavery. And right now we're being transformed into a spiritual being. We're forming a relationship with the Creator. We're beginning a dialogue with the Almighty. You can't just open the door and step into that. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you have to meet people, or you have to present people, or you have to go sell people. You know, you have to do your mental push-ups before you can walk into that room. You can't just walk into the shul and say, God, I'm here. You have to prepare yourself. Just like the Jews in the desert, they couldn't just go from being a slave to accepting the Torah. They needed to go through a process in order to develop themselves, in order to develop a relationship with God. Sometimes we forget the, the greatness and the awesomeness of God. It's not a simple thing. And if you want to have a relationship with the Creator, you got to prepare yourself. Just like you go to school, just like you go to college, just like you can read books. Before you meet Hashem, you have to prepare yourself. And first, before you can get to that rendezvous with God, you have to work on yourself. And even more so, like Chazal is telling us, you have to work on how you interact with others. Because once you've achieved harmony with yourself and with your surroundings, you'll be primed and ready to move to a higher level and to connect to the Creator. It's a prerequisite. You have to have some sort of harmony within yourself, with others, before you can step up to the plate and start to think you can connect to God. You can't skip those steps. But, if you don't take, if you don't take care of this basic level of Judaism, of refining yourself, your midot, your outlook, your interaction with others, there will be nothing waiting for you at the bottom of that mountain. Because the Jews in the desert, they achieved achdut. They had unity. They achieved it. They achieved am echad, lev echad. One nation, one heart. They were united. They were connected. They had unity. They had harmony within themselves and others. And that's why they merited to Matan Torah. And you must achieve the same feat in order to receive the Torah again in Shavuot. You have to understand, we've been given a formula. In order for the formula to work, you have to reciprocate it. You have to copy it. You have to achieve the same things that they did. In order to get their result, you have to do the same exercise as them. So, with a set of instructions from Hazal, practically a manual for success for this time period, which is called Pirkei Avot, with the energies of Iyar, the month of healing, and with the generation of the desert, this Dor De'a that we're talking about, forging the way for us over 3,000 years ago, that today we're able to still tap into that journey, still being able to tap into that uh, spiritual funnel of, of, of spiritual success, we have a huge opportunity to get upgraded as a Jew. We have a huge opportunity to get upgraded as a Jew individually, as well as a whole. As well as a whole as a Jewish nation. However, each one must do their part in order to achieve this true goal. The true goal of our existence, especially for Jews, Achdut, to get to Am Echad Lev Echad. And we can pause right here and just internalize how close or how far are we from that. You tell me, are we close or are we far from Am Echad Lev Echad? 
right here, right now, I feel I'm echad lev echad. Right? You're talking about just this room? Just this room right now. <laughs> I would go as yeah. far as to say maybe this community. I would go as far as to say maybe even South Florida. I would go as far as to say to every connected Jew. But what about the other ones? Can't leave them behind. That's my brother. That's my sister. We're family. Can't leave those behind. You can't become religious and then the secular becomes you know, yesterday's news. The red-headed stepchild that nobody wants to pay attention to. You can't do that. So how close are we to Am Echad Lev Echad? Whether we are or we're not, this is the time to get closer to that energy, to get closer to that, to that concept. And the more work we put in during these days, the more success that a larger group of people are closer to that goal. And the closer we get, the closer we bring the people that are around us, our family, our friends, people in our community. So it always starts with you. Before you go fix the world, fix yourself. And this is a good start. So Bezat Hashem, may we be able to internalize these teachings. May they permeate our essence, our neshama. And may we change and improve for the better and be a beacon of Jewish light. A beacon of Jewish light to all around us. And be able to achieve true unity in our hearts, mind and soul as we begin to study an instruction manual to Jewish life. Let's begin. Let's begin a small little journey, all of us in this room, into the heart and minds of our sages, as they guide us on the road of Torah and spiritual success. When I was reading Pirkei Avot, I said to myself, you know what, if I'm reading it for the first time, and I just cleared my mind, I erased everything, all the midrashim, all the learning that I did, I say, you know what, I'm reading it from beginning to end, and I want to see what feeling I get from it. Sometimes you have to get inspired to, to put together a class. So as I'm reading Pirkei Avot from beginning to end, I'm starting to see like popcorn, the message is popping up one by one and they're all interlaced together I mean some of them are real random good solid advice but I just felt like the rabbis were trying to tell me something so I put together a compilation of one or a few solid messages that interlace one into the other seamlessly that speak of the message of Amichad, Levichad, the true essence of this 49 day journey. Let's begin. Pirkei Avot begins with Kol Yisrael Yishlaim Chelek Le'olam Abba. It says, All Am Yisrael has the share in the world to come. Shenemai, as it is said, Vamecha Kulam Tzadikim, all your people are righteous. Newsflash, we're all righteous. The rabbi said. Le'olam Yeshuaretz, they shall inherit the land. We're going to go to Israel. When? And we're going to live there forever. Netzer Mata'ai, the branch of my plantings. Ma'aseh Adalit Pa'er, in which you take pride. Hashem says, you know, I planted a seed and it grew into a tree. And it's Am Yisrael. And look everybody, that's my tree. That's my nation. Hashem is proud of us. That's how Pirkei Avot begins. It lets, us, it lets us know that it's all good. Eventually, we have Olam Abba. Everybody has a share. One guy might have a studio. Another guy might have a 24-bedroom mansion. Who knows? But everyone has a share. What kind of share? That they didn't reveal. And we know that we have a loving Father that loves us, cares for us, watches out for us and also is proud of us <sighs> great way to start thank you now if we move towards some of the other lessons it begins with Shimon one of the lessons that it begins with is Shimon Shimon the righteous was one of the last men of the great assembly who I Omer he used to say the world is standing on three things. Imagine, here's the world, three pillars. 
This is what's holding up the world. What could it be? Ala Torah, vala avoda, vala gemilut chasadim. One pillar is the Torah. Second pillar, the temple service. Avoda. Now that we don't have the temple, what do we have? Of loving kindness. That's what's holding up the world. Torah, I understand. It's the foundation of everything. God looked at the Torah. It's His blueprint and He built the world. I understand that. Prayer? Hmm. How many lessons do we do on prayer? We know the power of prayer. The people in this room know the power of prayer. Many people have prayed and have gotten answered. People that know how to pray, their answers get their prayers get answered. And if you want to learn how to pray, look at some of our archived classes. It's all there. But gemilut chasadim, this act of loving kindness, it's one of those things that that's on us. That's on us. Acts of kindness. It's not about being kind to myself. It's all about being kind to what? To another person. Here we go. The journey started. Me, myself, and another Jew. What is it going to be? So the Rambam tells us something very interesting. He says there's a Pasuk in Tehillim in the 89th chapter that says, Chesed olam. You know what builds the world? You know what, what's the foundation of the world? Chesed. If people didn't do Chesed with one another, the world wouldn't exist. Chesedi bane olam. Furthermore, the Rambam says that the, 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 the rabbinical mitzvot that describe gemilut chasadim, which are, for example, like when I tell you what is acts of loving kindness, so the Rambam lists them as... Okay. Bikur Cholim, visiting the sick. Remove the dead, going to a person's burial. Bringing a bride to her canopy, making a bride happy and simcha in a, in a wedding. Departing guests, the livui, you know when you have guests, you know, very interesting halakha that you should learn. When people come over your house for Shabbat and they have an amazing meal and they have such a great time and you know, and, and it's like one of the best nights ever. And when the night is over, you stand right by the door, by the mezuzah, and you tell them, Bye, Shabbat Shalom, see you in shul tomorrow. And you close the door, it counts like you did nothing. You have to walk them out. Livui, you have to walk four amot. One, two, three, four. Bye, everyone. He did the, 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 pers- the perfect achnasat urchim. But if you miss that, those last four steps of livui, it doesn't count. So this is one of the acts of kindness. Departing guests. Also, digging a grave. Also, it talks about uh, that all these rabbinical mitzvot that we just mentioned right now, you can just summarize them all into He says, all these rabbinical mitzvot are actually The biblical connected to the biblical mitzvah of Vavta Rechakamocha, which was actually in Parashat Kedushim, last parasha, it was mentioned over there. In Hoshea, there's a pasuk that says that all the acts of benevolence that you do for each other, this is Hashem speaking, I'm sorry. He says, All the acts of benevolence that you do for each other are dearer to me than all thousands of sacrifices from the Temple of Solomon. Could you imagine? This is Hoshea, quote in, in the book of Hoshea, a quote of Hashem saying that when another Jew does an act of kindness with another Jew, it's more dear to him than the thousands of sacrifices of Bet HaMikdash. That is a very grand statement. Are you beginning to understand what in Hashem's eyes is how he values it. So it seems like being kind to one another is one of the first lessons that Chazal want us to learn in Pirkei Avot. However, if you go down a few more Prakim, a few more chapters, a few more Mishnayot, they bring up three other pillars. They say there's a three pillars that hold up the world. And it goes like this. This time it's Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel. A different rabbi that says, "Al hadin 
ועל האמת ועל השלום. He says the world stands on truth, I'm sorry, on, ju- on justice, on truth, and on peace. So truth and justice we can understand. There has to be truth and justice in the world, right? Otherwise, otherwise, otherwise it's going to turn into chaos, into mayhem, into anarchy. But the last piece, shalom, I want to introduce you to shalom. Shalom is not just hello. And shalom is not just a word that we say Shabbat shalom, like the second word that comes after Shabbat. The word shalom, which literally stands for peace, is that one thing that is on the top of Hashem's list. In other words, if Hashem had a set of priorities that He wanted to hand to us, you know what? Here is my top ten of top ten things that you should know that are important to me. If you look at number one, the one number one thing that is important for Kadosh Baruch Hu is shalom. It's so important. I don't know if you realize it. Anybody who prays every single day, do you ever see the Amida? If you go to, uh, to, to, the, to the Kaddish, Kaddish is all about Shalom and Amen. Yes, Shalama Rabba. What's Shalama? Shalom. Right away, the Birkat the, Amazon. Everywhere you go, if you open up, the, if you open up the, the Sidur and you count how many times the concept of peace is mentioned, it, it's outnumbered by any other, uh, it outnumbers any other concept. Hashem says you could even lie for peace. Not become a liar, you know, isheker. But it says if there is a situation where, you know, you and your wife are beefing and, uh, you know, a little white lie right now would keep the peace for another two weeks, three weeks, or a month, you know what Hashem says? Go for it. <laughs> Go for it. If He says that, you know what, that you're seeing two people right now, and you know... If you can bend the truth a little bit in order to increase the peace in the world, do it. Now we say, it's, it's interesting, because the Mishnah is coupled with tzedek, din, and emet. Din and emet have nothing to do with bending the truth. But shalom is more than din and more than emet. It's the number one thing in Hashem's list. And, in the, and actually in our Amida we say, there's a connection, we say, Sim Shalom, Tova Vecha, Chaim, Chen Vechesed, Bracha Vechamim. And then it goes a little bit more and says, Tzedakah uh, Vechesed, and says, Ahava Vishalom. No, Ahava Vechesed, Tzedakah Vechamim, Beracha Vishalom. They coupled two words together because they say one thing leads to the other. And when it came to shalom, it says, you know what's shalom? When there's shalom, they coupled it with bracha, blessing. Anyone who gets connected to peace, gets connected to blessings. However, you should know that peace, shalom, encompasses all the good in the world. For when all are in peace, all is good. All are united. And all are in harmony with one and with all. With yourself and with others. Peace is the ultimate goal of existence. If you ever want to know what's the end game, what is the purpose of life, is that so all of existence can live in peace which attracts God to come, de- come back down from the heavens and live and dwell amongst us. Right now Hashem is there. We push Him away with our actions. But when we start to have peace within ourselves, within our community, within our nation, within our race, within the world, world peace, Hashem says, okay, I can be here. And He starts to come down, come down. And just like the time of Beit HaMikdash, He will live with us in this world. It's the ultimate goal of existence. What's the opposite of peace? Division. Separation. And this is 
either on a personal level or even as a race. Sometimes when you don't have peace, it's the lack of personal peace. A lot of people need that, that inner peace. When they don't have that peace, even on a personal level, you have to achieve it. And most of it happens because you don't have personal fulfillment. When somebody's fulfilled, they're in peace with themselves. When you're not fulfilled, you start to feel the separation from yourself. You start to feel the, the division from who you really are. Because peace, even though that we always want world peace, but peace is actually very personal. It first starts with you and being in peace with yourself. And then it becomes peace, becomes communal, your community or your surroundings, and then becomes global. But it's a very personal thing. Even though that peace is a worldly endeavor that many, many people in this world are trying to achieve. But a lot of people are in the way. So, in order to achieve peace, we have to turn to a teacher. Someone who is able to achieve it. We want to learn from him. We want to emulate him. And according to his teachings, we can transform ourselves and our surroundings. Who's that man? Who achieved peace? Who was able to promote peace? Who was able to instill peace in his surroundings? That man is in our next Mishnah. Hillel v'shamay kiblu mehem. Hillel and Shammai, two Torah giants of the Gemara, are quoting here in Mishnah saying, Hillel Omer, Hillel saying, Heve mital midav shel Aaron. Be from the students of Aharon. Ohev shalom v'rodev shalom. He loved peace and he pursued peace. He chased peace. Ohev taberiot, he loved the people. Om karavan la Torah, and he brought him closer to Hashem. Who's that man? Aharon. Aharon has a label on him. You know, sometimes we like to label people. He's a good guy, he's a bad guy, he's cheap, he's, he's funny, you know, labels. What's Aharon's label? Ohev shalom. Rodef Shalom. That's what he was known for. He loved peace. And he chased it. He was an exemplary individual on so many levels. But he was famously known for chasing peace and promoting peace. He was a person who shies away from fighting with his wife, fighting with his family, extended family, he was the example how a person can get along with his neighbors and he can bring people that are feuding together. He even goes in search of a fight just to help bring a resolution. Aharon HaKohen was looking for a fight, but for all the good reasons. He was looking for a fight, but just to help it to achieve peace. And what was his winning formula to bring two people that are fighting together? Imagine, he would hear that two guys in shul weren't getting along. He'd get into his car, he'd drive to Boca, he'd knock on his door, and he'd say, what happened? Ah, you know, such and such said such and such, and I feel like such and such. He said, I can't believe it. You know why? Because he begged me to come over to you to tell you that he wants to make up with you. Really? Is that what he said? Yeah. And then Aharon would get into his car and would drive to Delray Beach, even further out. And he'd come over and tell us and knock on the door. He's like, what are you doing here? He's like, I was just at, you know, this guy's house. And he wants to make up with you. He wants to be, you know, he wants to make things good again. He told me to come here. Really? That was his formula. He would go over to the people. Pirkei Avot tells us that he would go and tell them that each one wants to make with one another. And that would sort of like break the ice. It would break the tension. And it would set the path to reconciliation. 
That's what he did. And he would do that for husbands and wives. He would do that for friends, for family. He would do it for any Jew. He would go out and try to make them make up. I'll stop right here and say, when's the last time you did it? When's the last time you drove down all the way to Orlando so your friend can make up with his wife? When's the last time you picked up the phone to instill peace between two brothers, two friends, or a married couple, the most common case of this day and age? When's the last time you pursued the peace process in your surroundings? When's the last time you pursued peace with your husband? Or with your wife? Are you even chasing peace in your own home? Are you chasing peace with your children? Don't go too far. Before you fix the world, fix yourself. When's the last time you tried to bend and make believe that, you know what? It's not worth it. She's 100% wrong. But for the sake of peace... I'm going to let it go. It's easy to say. I'll tell you here firsthand, it's very difficult to carry out. But that's our challenge. But that's Aharon. He was a pro at it. Furthermore, it says, Umekarev la Torah. And he would bring them closer to the Torah. He would bring them closer to the ways of the Torah. He would come and bring peace among them and they would look at him like look at this Torah Jew what a champ how does he do it look at us over here this guy is a he's a Kohen Gadol he's got so much responsibilities he's such a holy man what is he doing over here in my kitchen trying to make me get along with my wife wow that's the Torah that's the greatness of the Torah he'd bring them closer to the Torah But what is the way of the Torah? What is it? 5,779, right? 2019. What is the way of the Torah? Is it that 613? Can we, can we, is it possible for us to perform 613? The answer is no. Because half the mitzvot don't apply. Not everyone is going to have a chance to do a brit milah to their son. Not everyone's going to have a chance to get divorced. Not everyone's going to have a chance to uh, bring Korbanot and Bet HaMikdash. As a matter of fact, if you really, really chop everything down, the rabbi tells us there's less than 200 mitzvot that we really have to keep. And some of them we still can't perform because, like I said, not everyone's going to have boys. Not everyone's going to, not, not, not everyone's going to be able to do Pidyon Ben, that the firstborn is a boy. Mm-hmm. It's another mitzvah. You know, not, so many different things. So it's actually diluted down to almost like 80 or 90. So it's easy. <laughs> right? There's a small book that talks about the actual mitzvot that, are, that you can do. I think it's 118, and if you're a guy or if you're a girl, it's a little bit less, a little bit different. That's why I say, so, you know, what's the way of the Torah? 613? No. So what is it? Is it to be a Talmud Chacham? Is it that guy in a black suit and a hat and a beard that shtags all day long? Eating up books? Is that the way of the Torah? What's the way of the Torah? What is it? Can you simplify it for me? Can you teach it to me on one leg? I don't have time. I have places to go, people to see. I'm busy. But I'll give you a few minutes to tell me some divrei Torah. What is the way of the Torah, please? Well... A lot of people think that it's all spiritual. It's not of this world. Ah, well, you know, being religious is trying to be an angel. Can't do this, can't do that. You're completely focused on God. Can't, can't do all the things that I, that I enjoy. That's the vantage point when you're from the outside. On the inside, it's completely different. But what do the rabbis tell us? Rabban Gamliel ben Osher Biudan Asi Omer these are huge Torah giants. Rabbi Yudan Nasi is the author. Uh, he was the head of the, of the Great Assembly. And the author of the Mishnah. His son, Rabban Gamliel, a, a giant, <laughs> shares with us. I won't read you the entire Mishnah, just the part that's relevant to us. 
יפה תלמוד תורה עם דרך ארץ. He says, excellent is the study of the Torah when combined with a worldly occupation. What does that mean? So, דרך ארץ in this particular Mishnah means a worldly occupation. In other words, a job. You have to do regular life. You got to wake up and do the nine to five. Right? However, we're saying over here that what's is it, what, Yafet Talmud Torah, it's good that you learn Torah, Aim Derech Eretz, with having a worldly occupation. So in other words, we're saying, learn Torah and go to work. Have both. A little bit of the spiritual and a little bit of the mundane. Both. You need the balance. It's good to be working and it's good to be studying Torah. So you should know there was a machloket in the Gemara between Rabbi Shmael and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. They said, you know, what is the best way? Should a person sit and study all day long and believe and trust that Hashem will provide for him? Or should one go out and work? So Rabbi Shmael held of the opinion that you have to sit and learn all day long. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said, many people have tried to sit and learn. And you know what happens? They don't learn. So you know what happens? They don't learn and they don't go to work, so they end up with nothing. So the majority of the people weren't able to just learn all day long and be successful at it. So the conclusion of the Gemara was that a man needs to do both. He needs to learn Torah and he needs to work. Derech Eretz, im Torah. You need both. In Masechet Brachot you can get the details of that Machloket. It's very interesting actually. However, Talmud Torah and Derech Eretz, there's another way to learn it. Talmud Torah is the learning of Torah. Derech Eretz is having manners, moral ethics, good social values. This is something you usually hear the, the parents tell their kids all the time. Where's your Derech Eretz? You think they're telling them, where's your job? <laughs> you know, where's your occupation? Where, you know, where's your paycheck? Where's your Derech Eretz? Where's your manners? Where's your values? What did we teach you? Where's your social values, the good social values we're trying to instill in you? You're out of line. Derech Eretz im Torah. You got to have both. You can't just be a Torah guy. Remember what we said about Rabbi Akiva's students? They were huge Torah giants. What happened? No Derech Eretz. They didn't know how to interact with one another. They'd look across the, the table, see the Chavruta, and they had a huge, huge Chidush. A huge nuance on the Torah. And they were, instead of sharing it, you know, they'd look at, ah, this guy, he'll never get it. On a much higher level. I'm so much smarter. I'm so much holier. If I share this with him, he won't even get it. And he didn't do it. They didn't have a proper interaction with one another. The Bnei Sachar gave an even uh, more beautiful interpretation. He says, Talmud Torah is what? Is the scholars. You know? We have rabbis that learn Torah. You got to love those guys. You got to love those rabbis that are able to sit down for 8, 10, 12, 14 hours a day and have the cup, have the mind to where the mind doesn't turn into mush. They go from subject to subject, from page to page, from concept to concept, and nothing, just absorbing everything. Uh, chapeau. I, give my, I take my hat off to those, to those rabbis and to those people and to those avrechim and to those students. Those are the Talmud Torah. Derech Eretz, that's the blue-collar Jew. That's the Jew that he can't do that. Not everybody can sit down and learn for 10 hours a day. But he does go to work. He does know how to make money. So when you read the Pasuk, Derech Eretz, Torah, Derech Eretz Im Torah, what's the combination? Is when the Torah Jew and the, 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 the regular Jew, the, the, the regular Joe, the working Jew, they're living together. And they appreciate each other. That when they walk into Shul on Shabbat, ah, look at this tzaddik. Look at him. He's amazing. He sits all day learn and learns. He's holding up the world. And that tzaddik is looking at that guy and says, look at this guy. 
going every day to work, supporting. And even though he can't learn for 10 hours, he comes to the lighthouse on Wednesdays for an hour. He sits on Shabbat for a half hour and learns. Not only that, I even heard that sometimes he sponsors classes and he gives $101 so other people can learn. They appreciate each other. Derch Eretz Eim Torah. Furthermore, Chazal tell us, En Torah, En Derech Eretz. If there's no Torah, there's no Derech Eretz. Ve'im En Derech Eretz, En Torah. And if you don't have Derech Eretz, En Torah. Which means what? You can't have Torah and not have good social values. You can't have good social values and not have Torah. You can't pick one. As a Jew, you must have what? Both. You have to have both. That's what's expected of us. You can't choose. You can't say, hey, I'm a good guy and ignore the Torah. You can't be a Torah Jew and say, you know what, I don't care about anybody else, it's just me and Hashem. Uh uh uh. You gotta have both. As a matter of fact, when they, it continues to say, when they say, en Torah, en der Heretz, en der Heretz, en Torah, that they go hand in hand, which means what? Something else goes, hands in hand, it goes hand in hand. Torah and Parnassah. We have another Mishnah that says, En Kemach, En Torah. En Torah, En Kemach. What does that mean? Kemach is flour. Flour makes bread. Bread on the street means what? Money. Right? Parnassah. He says, you want Parnassah? You need Torah. If you don't have Torah, there's no Parnassah. In other words, there's another thing that's tied into Torah. Is that if you're, in order for you to be successful in the workplace, right? From before it was about how you interact. But now that you're the way you're interacting, you also need to make parnasa. Don't think you can just give all your days and all your hours just for work. I'm busy. I'm making a living. Make a living, but make sure you study at least a half hour in the morning and maybe another half hour at night. If you could do more hour in the morning, hour at night. Don't think that you can let go of the Torah learning. En Kemach, En Torah. En Torah, En Kemach. They're interlaced, they're connected. And this is strengthening Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's opinion that you got to have to have both. They go hand in hand. Furthermore, another Mishnah says, Shammai Omer, Aset Torah Chakeva. Shammai says, make sure that you set times for Torah, that you learn. Emor me'ad v'aser be. Be a man of actions, not a man of words. Jews, it's about actions, not words. Ah, too much talking is not good. Ve'eve mekabel et kol adam b'ser p'ni yafot. And make sure that you receive all people or all men with a pleasant face or pleasant countenance. So here comes again, Ben Adam Lechavero. Once again, we get to the point of how? Interacting with another Jew. Receiving another Jew with a pleasant demeanor. Furthermore, if we go to a different Mishnah, and take another excerpt from there, it says, And heve magdim b'shalom kol adam. Be the first one to say hello. In other words, when you're walking around, don't be a grouch. Be happy, be pleasant. Hi! Hello, good morning, how you doing? Be a happy Jew. When did we become these, uh, you know, the stigma, this label that's been put on us? Whiners, complainers, doom and gloom, you know, kvetching all the time. That's not a Jew. How you doing, Asher? How's everything? Everything okay? That's the Jew. Don't worry, be happy, that's us. How did we morph to this... Uh, different character that we've taken upon ourselves. You should know that we are God's children. We should be happy. We are sons of a king. As a matter of fact, in a following Mishnah it says, Chavivin Israel shinikru banim lamakom. It says that Bnei Israel are called sons to God. La Makom. Makom is another way of saying Hashem. As a matter of fact, I believe in Sefer Shemot, God calls Am Yisrael 
בני בכורי, my son, my first born. So that means Hashem says, you're my child. And what do we say to God? Abba, we call him Abba, Abba Sheba Shemaim. We have Abba in this world, right? And then we say Abba Sheba Shemaim. Do you know what a parent is most concerned with? If you have children, you'll know the answer. What's the one thing that a per- parent is most concerned about? Safety of their children. Their children. That's what a parent cares about. Their children. And even more so, you know what they really care about? How somebody's treating their children. <laughs> if you have kids in school, go look how the mothers put the teachers under a microscope. God forbid their children should come home without a meal or somebody scratched them or something happened. All of a sudden the cougar comes alive. <laughs> Mama bear, right? They're very, very concerned about their children. So when somebody mistreats the son of a king or the daughter of a king, hurts them, insults them, cheats them, hates them, what type of relationship do you think you're going to develop with that father? No relationship. No relationship. I don't know any parent who's going to befriend someone who is being nasty to their children in whatever which way. Similarly is Hashem and the Jews. What happens when you mistreat another Jew? Hashem wants nothing to do with you. Tell me which parent befriends someone that mistreats their child. How can you have that? You see the guy, pow, hits your child. Hey, buddy, want to go have a beer? (laughs) Isn't that right? Go, go, go see uh, an adult, yell at a child. And then the mother comes and says, hey, you want to go get your nails done? Parents are like, cold shoulder, are you kidding me? You just hit my son, you just spoke to my son, you just mistreated my child. How do you think God feels when somebody mistreats his children? However, the opposite is also true. When one is loved by one's children, imagine your children come and say, Oh, I love that teacher. Oh, I love that guy. What happens? The parents are so open to befriending them, liking them, right? Because there's a relationship, there's a connection. The parents connect when their children are love or have a good relationship with. And it's very, very important to protect this relationship. To protect this relationship between Jew to Jew, between brother and brother, so the parent can give you attention. So Hashem can like you. It's very important to protect that relationship. You don't want Hashem to turn His back on you and say, you're mistreating my children, I can't talk to you right now. It's very, very important to protect that relationship with God. That's why when you get into uncomfortable situations with another Jew, for whatever reason, family affairs, business affairs, day-to-day happenings, make sure to give another Jew the benefit of the doubt. Give another Jew the opportunity to prove themselves right. Innocent before proven guilty. In Hebrew it's called kafzchut. And there's another Mishnah. It says, Yehoshua ben Pechia Omer, Ase lecha rav, ukne lecha chaver, veheve dan et kol adam lekav shchut. It says, judge all men with the scale weighted in his favor. In other words, this world has an epidemic where people uh, are quick to jump to judging another person without even hearing the whole story. About a week ago, my rabbi in the Kola, Rabbi uh, Rabbi David, I will say the story in his honor, told me a very interesting story. 
You know, we always have a lot of, a lot of stories of kaf schut. You know, always judge another guy. You never know what happened last night. You know, you know, like for example, a guy comes to shul every day to minyan. One day he comes exactly to alenu shabach. And you look at the guy, you know, seriously? This is when you come to shul, you start judging him. Meanwhile, the guy was up four times last night with the baby. He didn't even sleep. Even to get to shul is, is a bigger feat than anybody else over there. Yet the other guy's looking at him, oh, look at this guy, I'm so much better. I was here 6.30. I prayed for an hour and a half. He's here for three minutes and he's leaving. You call that prayer, buddy? Judging. You don't know what happened last night. Kavzchut. Many, many stories. However, I just want to share this story with you because it's very interesting. There's a... And maybe you've heard many different versions of it. When I repeated the story, everybody said, I heard it like this, I heard it like that, whatever. I heard this from my rabbi, this is the story. There's a guy in Israel walking by the bus stop and he sees a piece of paper... Uh, with, with a phone number saying uh, I am in need of a bone marrow transplant if you can help please call this number so the guy is walking around waiting for the bus at one point he says you know what got nothing to do and you know this is a religious boy yeshiva boy he, he learns to do chesed he says yeah why not he takes the number he calls he makes the appointment makes the test wouldn't you know it perfect match perfect match match wow he goes he meets the guy they talk for eight hours straight huge connection like they knew each other their entire life and he comes home and he tells his father abba i'm gonna do a big mitzvah i'm gonna save another jew's life tells him oh yeah who's this he tells the guy his name you know uh the mr uh, shlomo zilberstein Zilberstein? He's like, yeah. He's like, they're not even religious. He says, okay, yeah, but you know, they're secular. It's okay, but Zat Hashem, they'll make tshuva soon. But wait, wait, wait. Is this from the Zilberstein family? And he starts to describe him. He says, yeah. He says, over my dead body. You are not giving that boy anything. He says, Abai, why? I learned chesed. I can do it. I can save another Jew's life. It's either me or him. And if you're going to do it, I'm leaving the house. I mean, he went all in. And this went on for weeks and weeks and weeks in the house. There was a lot of uneasiness in the house. And he did, the kid didn't know what to do. Finally, he goes to his rabbi. He goes to him, Rabbi, listen, my father is threatening to leave the house if I do this bone marrow transplant. The guy is dying. Time is running out. I'm a perfect match. I want to do it. My father is against it. What should I do? He says, listen, Pesach is coming up. He's going to be drinking four, four cups of wine. Nichnas yan yetzasod. I'll come over after the, the seder and we'll talk to your father. We'll see what it is. So he did that. He came over after the seder night and his father was in a good mood and he comes to him, Abba, you know, please tell me, please tell me, why don't you want me to donate to this boy and save his life? He's another Jew. He goes to him, I'll tell you why. He says, this guy's father... This guy's father, I will never, never forgive him. He says, what happened? He says, me and his father were in the Holocaust. And in the Holocaust, you should know the times were very tough. And food was very hard to come by. And as a matter of fact, you used to have a little brother. And this little brother of yours was so tiny that we would use him to go into the barracks of the Nazis, steal pieces of bread, and he would bring the bread to us, we would eat it, and then we would hide him in the ceiling so nobody could know him. So he was completely hidden. And he was the, the guy that would bring us food, and that's how we survived. This guy, Zilberstein, they put him like as a cop over us. And one time, some way, somehow, we found out about your brother. And the Nazis sent him and he went to look for him. And wouldn't you know it? He knew that we were hiding him in the ceiling. And he just tapped on the ceiling a couple of times. The wood was frail, it broke, and he fell to the floor. And he took him. And he took him since that day and never saw him again. As a matter of fact, just a few minutes later after he took him, he was ordered by the Nazis to have him shot. And a few minutes after he was taken, I heard, pa pa, two bullets. He killed your brother. I will never forgive him. And you will not help his son live. 
the rabbi hears this, he says, is this true? Could this be? I have to verify this. He goes to Mr. Zilberstein. He goes to him, I just heard an incredible story from the Holocaust, is it true? He tells him, yes, it is true. I did take his son. But when I took his son and the Nazis, the two Nazis that told me that they want me to shoot him, what I did is I did shoot, but I shot them. Boom, boom. I killed the two Nazis. And I ran as fast as I can to the nearest church, and I put that kid over there, and they saved him. They held him until the war was over, and after the war was over, I picked him up. But you should know I got caught. I got caught. And because I got caught, they punished me. And you know how they punished me? They castrated me. I can't have children anymore. I couldn't have that. I couldn't have. I can't have children anymore. So after the war, I took that kid and I made him my own. So he says. So that's his son. He says, "Yeah." He says, "No wonder it's a perfect match. They're brothers." He came back, and we see how important it is to give a kaf schut the benefit of the doubt because when things are so complicated and so intricate, and you think one hundred percent that you are right. And they are wrong. Behind the scenes, we know nothing. It's very, very important in all situations to give kafshut until you get all the information. How many families are now in turmoil because they're judging each other and they don't have half the, or they have half the story? Half the people that are fighting in this world, what happened? Well, 21 years ago, something happened. What? I don't remember anymore. <laughs> but I know we don't talk and you don't talk and your children will never talk to that family again. Why? Because the kaf's chut went out the window. In conclusion, as we are on this journey of spiritual and character refinement, this 49 days of the Omer, we're studying Pirkei Avot, and we're trying to refine our understanding of another Jew, our, interna- our interaction with one another. We must understand that this journey of bettering our midot is just an exercise to become worthy of meeting Hashem in Shavuot. To being worthy of Hashem liking us enough to give us a gift in Shavuot. All we're doing right now is we're putting in the work so when we come to Hashem, He says, yeah, I like you. I like you. You treat my kids nice. You can be my friend. You, you, can, you can come on board. You know what? I'm going to give you a gift. What's the gift? Here, here's the Torah. What's Matan Torah? The word Matan comes from the word Matana, from the word gift. Hashem gives you the gift of Torah. He says this year, you're going to go up a level. This year, your spirituality is going to go a little bit higher. You're going to be able to understand me a little bit better. Your Torah concepts are going to be a little bit better. Your connection on Shabbat and on the holidays is going to be a little bit better. Why? You put in the work. You showed me that you want to connect to my boys, to my girls. And because you showed me how you want to interact with my children, then I'm going to give you a gift, the gift of Torah. And you should know, every Shavuot we get this gift. And you see, every year, if you're tapped in, if you're connected to the holidays, to, to, to all the different things that are available to us as Jews, after Shavuot, it's very exciting. Because you say to yourself, what's this year's Chidushim going to be? Oh, I can't wait for Bereshit. You know, sometimes you feel like you know everything about the parasha. And then comes all of a sudden a new chidush that you never heard before. Oh, what's going to be this year? This year I had such a good... I was so successful at chesed. I was so successful with charity. What's this year going to be like? What's gonna, it becomes exciting. Because you don't know when you open up that gift of Torah. What's that gift? All of our lesson is encapsulated in this one final Mishnah. Hey, last year we did an entire class just on this Mishnah. But the question goes, What's the proper way that a person should cling, uh, cling on to, that you should hold on to? So the different rabbis give different opinion. Rabbi Eliezer Omer, Ayn Tova, a person who has a good eye. I'm not going to go into the explanation of each one. I'm just going to go for the punchline. Rabbi Yushai Omer, Chaver Tov. You know what's a good way to be? A good friend. Rabbi Yushai Omer, Shachen Tov. Rabbi says, no, a good neighbor is the, is, is, is the right way to be, is the, is the right path to be on. 
רבי שמעון אומר, הרואה את הנולד. He says, you know, it's a good path, one who can see the future, one who can see what's coming, one who can anticipate life. רבי אליעזר אומר, לב טוב. רבי אליעזר says, no, a good heart. אמר להם, רואה אני את דברי אלעזר בן ערך מדבריכם, שבכלל דבריו דבריכם. He says, רבי אליעזר that says, לב טוב, a good heart, that encapsulates everybody into it, the good heart. לב טוב. Why? When you have a heart, you feel. When you can feel for another Jew, you're there. When you're driving on the highway and you see a guy with a big black hat on a, with a flat tire and you drive by and you say, oh, I hope everything's okay. Mm. When you see that guy and you're driving by and you say, oh, I hope everything's okay. Let me say a perk of Tehillim for him. Huh. <laughs> you're getting there. When you see him and you say, you know what? Maybe I should pull over. <clears throat> and you pull over and you help. You've achieved left of. You're there. Okay? If you take the numerical value of Lev Tov, Lev, Lamed Bet, is 32. Tov is, uh, is numerical value 17. 32 plus 17. Come on, guys. 49. 49. You know how you get to Lev Tov? You know how you get to the, to, the, to, the, to the good heart? When you spend 49 days of the Omer working on yourself. The end result is Lev Tov. And not only is it the left tov, but Hashem sees, look at this guy. 49 days he's working on it. He earned the left tov over here. Here's your gift, the gift of Torah. In a generation of iPhones, selfies, where people are so enamored by themselves, people are in love with themselves. It's unbelievable. I've never taken, I've seen so many people take solo pictures. Before it used to be, can you take my picture? It's me and my friends, it's me and Mickey, it's me and something. People are in love with themselves. They're like, I don't need anybody, it's just me. And they're taking a lonely. It's like the generation of me, myself, and I. It really is. As a Jew, this generation we must turn into me, myself, and another Jew. You are one slash of 14 million. We have no lone wolves over here. You, you, can't be in, you can be an individual, but you're a part of a whole. There are 14 million Jews in the world. You're one of them. And we're all one. Imagine one huge human body with 14 million little dots. That's the Jew. You're part of that. And we must live in, we must stick together, unite, live in peace. And we must yearn for this peace in our personal lives, in our collective Jewish lives. And once we do that, it will manifest naturally. You know, it's the law of the land and the law of the Torah. The rabbis revealed to us when the Jews are in peace, when we are united, the whole world is in peace. This world peace that everybody is striving for depends on us. The job of fixing the planet was given to the handyman of the world, the Jew. Hashem sent us down with a toolkit and He says, go and fix it. Here's my Torah, here's Pirkei Avot, here's Torah classes. Start to fix the world. And when we are united, and when we start to work on ourselves and becoming the uh, the all these Torah concepts that we learn and we begin to apply them and they spread from us to our family, to our community, to our larger community, to Am Yisrael, the world automatically starts to shift to be in a state of peace. It all depends on us. It's time for us to work on the interactions with one another. It's what Hashem wants from us. And if you don't believe me, look, look, start reading Pirkei Avot, start counting the Omer, go into, uh, start reading Parashat Emor, and more and more you see, the me all the messages that we learned tonight are interlaced into that. 
Comes Shavuot, all of a sudden, boom, a different subject. All of a sudden, when we're talking about different things. This is what Hashem wants us to toil with during this time period. In order so we can merit to that honorable meet and greet of, uh, of us and Hashem in, the, in Shavuot to receive the Torah again. Bezat Hashem, that we merit to Achdut, to Hava, and Shalom. Thank you so much for being here. Sorry for keeping you late.